records office well no but it's the annex i'd really rather see what down by the river yes that's the place where they keep all the really valuable documents miss if you knew how to dispose of these documents to the right people you'd be better off robbing this place than you would the bank of england oh darling it's beautiful thank you you really do spoil me perhaps i have to you might run away if i don't Bruce Miller, I love you. Uh, yes? Uh, yes? Well, I think the, uh, the contract should appeal to you, Mr. Miller, and uh, if we could get together sometime... Be at my office at 10 in the morning for discussions. Thank you for calling. How'd you like to get away for a while? Away? Singapore, say, or Hong Kong? Oh, darling, I'd love it, but huh, we couldn't afford it, could we? It may be possible. When you gave up the army, you said you'd have 15 years of travelling and wanted to stay in one spot. I didn't have anyone like you in my unit. Ah, well. So you like Singapore. I'll show you places you never dream about. Darling, what are you going on about? Who was that on the phone? He's interested in buying the business and he's talking big money. How'd you like to do the whole thing? Singapore, India, Italy, Europe, the lot. Oh, darling, I'd love it. Oh, I've just noticed the fairs. England, see your mother and father. Well, it's nice to dream. It's no dream, Sue. I might just surprise you. Uh, thanks. Do you have to start early? Pupil, nine o'clock. Oh, you hardly slept at all last night, tossing and turning. You do look tired. Tired or old? Well, how do you expect me to look? You wanted to go home, didn't you? You want this trip, right? Bruce, I didn't ask for all this. It was, it was you. You'd rather have stayed an army wife, is that what you mean? I married a soldier and I accepted that. You decided to leave the army. It was your idea. You wanted to get out of married quarters, right? It had nothing to do with that. You know the real reason why you resigned, don't you? I'm younger than you, and you, you can never forget it. it. It's never mattered to me, but, but with you, it's almost an obsession. Your, your jealousy and your doubts tore you to pieces while you were in Vietnam, so that's why you got out as soon as you could. You think I don't trust you? I know you don't, and there's nothing I can do about it. It's your fight.
too big a part. There we are. Thank you. Oh, I'm playing that machine. Is there any machine you're not playing? Well, there are plenty more. We haven't met. My name's Bonaparte. Oh. Well, mine's not Josephine, so run along. Heard anything of Brian lately? What did you say? Brian Spencer. That's not in very good taste, Mr. Bonaparte. I agree, Miss Rockwell. Neither is murder. I told you not to come here. I had to see you. This bloke Bonaparte's a cop. Tell me something I don't know. Well, doesn't it worry you? Why should it? Well, he just seems to be taking a lot of interest in you and your father. I thought you ought to know. Now, look, I'm Jack. I'm sure he's taking a lot of interest in you too, Jack. I've got nothing to hide. And you think we have? I don't know. Tell us what else he's interested in. Blade's boat. Jack, I know how you feel about Diana. I don't want to embarrass her, but I'm sure she feels the same about you. So I feel we can trust you. I'm sure you'd want to do everything you can for her. How do you mean? Well, the fact is, we've done a rather silly thing. Uh, purely with the best of intentions. You might be able to help us out. Come into the house, Jack, and have a drink. Well, come on. I didn't expect to see you again so soon. Would you, would you care for a drink? Not just now. Have you seen anything of Jack Wilton this afternoon, Miss Rockwell? Jack? No. I thought I saw him leaving, but obviously I was mistaken. You had any other visitors? No. You didn't by any chance hear a shot just now? Shot? Yes, like... bang. Oh, I've had a record player on. I, I really didn't hear anything. What has something happened to Jack? Just what do you want from us, Mr. Bonaparte? Inspector. Inspector. Brian Spencer would do for a start. That's absurd. And stupid. Harboring a killer makes you both accomplices to murder. Brian wasn't a killer. That's a stupid thing to do. Father, keep his ammunition. I don't. He's a death. Oh. Thanks, yes. Oh, please. I'll give you a hand. It's only a homemade punch, but fun. I got the recipe from a dear old man in Somerset. Fifteen black. I must say, what a sweet little dress. It really suits you. Thank you. You gonna try your life tonight, Bobby? Not me. I hate to lose. I must circulate. Well, I did. No more bits. What do you want? Scotch, preferably, but this'll do. Surprise! I thought you two. No, no, we uh, we changed our minds. Yeah, the last moment. Oh, how lovely! Come and give me a hand, Madeline, darling. I hate to drag you away. We're nearly out of ice. Yeah. See you in a minute. How did you get in here? What? Weren't we invited? No more bits. What do you want? Scotch, preferably, but this will do. Nine red. Name and address, please. You know damn well. They love playing games. Not at this time of the night, we don't. Now, will you please answer the question? Roberta Hughes, and I live here too, You're with my husband. You're not finished yet. I'd ask you a few questions. Thank you, Mrs. Hughes. I don't know why you bother us. Why aren't you out catching real criminals? We try to accommodate everybody, madam. This is very embarrassing, Sergeant. There were some very influential people here tonight. Yes, so I know. They won't like it, not one bit. Mm -hmm. Name and address, please, sir. It's not as if we were doing any harm. Rooms. I don't make the law, Mr. Hughes. Then it should be changed. All right, you've got a lot of influential friends. Get them to do something about it. Well, we all have to go to court. It can't be dealt with in your absence. Speak to your solicitor. Instead of wasting time here, mind you doing something about my wife's jewellery? I'm sure you can find your own way out, Sergeant. You found it in easily enough. Good night. Like hell it was. 
bloody police. What do we pay them for? Never around when you want them. Just attitude. That's what gets me. He was only doing his job. So was Eichmann. Who? Before your time, darling. Well, why can't he do his job somewhere else? You know, I just got onto a winning streak. I had five thousand dollars worth of chips in my hands, and they march in. I'd only changed three hundred a few minutes before. Not worth a bean now. You mean you can't get your money for them? Well, who's going to shell out? Senior bloody Sergeant Madden. Nightclub, anyone? Mm, not for me. I'm ready for bed. Mm, you do look a little tired around the eyes. Still, shouldn't hurt at your age, Stanley. Uh, well, just a quick one, then we'll get going. Oh, it's a license, aren't they? You going somewhere? Aye, riding with Dan Clark to Melbourne. Now? I've got to see the postmaster. Find out what they've done with the letters. Well, perhaps they've lost my whereabouts. Don't know where I am. I mean, it's been five months now. Without a letter from the family. There's got to be some explanation. They've arrested Brendan O'Hara. Oh, aye. He must have a license with a claim as rich as his. Aye. He says the trooper tore it up. Up to some tomfoolery, I expect. Well, I don't call tearing up a license tomfoolery. I didn't mean the trooper, lass. I mean O'Hara. Baiting the traps is his favorite recreation. They respond in kind. He's got himself to blame. It's not like that. There's real trouble brewing, George. Well, it's the third license out this month, and the diggers have had enough. Aye. I've remonstrated with Mr. Fitzalan. Oh? Then I'm only a woman. Only? You should be spokesman. Spokesman, eh? For a buffoon the likes of O'Hara. Not now, lass. I have troubles of my own. And Dan Clark's waiting in his tent. <laughs> Lucas. Oh, please be seated, gentlemen. I attended your meeting last night. I was standing outside the tent, like many others, I couldn't get inside. Uh, it was a good roll-up. I just wanted to congratulate you on the way you handle the crowd and on your decisions. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, I was pleased with the way things went to myself. It shows that diggers want action. Oh. Yeah. And I'm the man to give it to them. Yeah. I won't let them down. Yeah. This is Lucas. Mr. Fitzalan. I thought to see you at the Lansdowne tomorrow. I wasn't invited, Mr. Commissioner. I'm afraid my articles on the land question must have upset me for Lansdowne. Yes, quite. No doubt you're here collecting information for another article. Yes, quite. You can't arrest them all. Well, there are many things I can't do. Sewing a patch is one of them. I wonder, would you oblige, if we're to maintain the dignity of the law? Most grateful to you. You can see defeat, then. Oh, yes, ma'am, yes. I'm no great hand at patches. I meant the diggers. The diggers had won. Did you have some part in this? Some. Well, I trust you'd be as pleased when the commissioner calls in the 40th Regiment. He wouldn't dare. It depends how hard he's pressed. As you've already said, I can't arrest them all. He's bluffing. You've only to point out to him the consequences. Well, I'm pointing them out to you, the uh, consequences of encouraging men to break the law. An unjust law. 30 shillings a month for a miner's license. There's uh, nothing unjust about that. Brandon O'Hara takes more from the ground than a day. There are many more starving for every man like him. Oh, but he is the agitator. Because he has a conscience. Something you wouldn't understand. Possibly. But I am fed, clothed, and remunerated by Her Majesty. Uh, in return, I undertake to protect her laws. Now, if I were to fail in that duty, I'd be defrauding her. Just like all of your friends, with consciences. Is that really where you stand? Yes. How pompous. You began the talk of consciences. Stick to patches, ma'am. You sew very prettily. Don't start something you can't finish, sir. Finish it yourself. Good evening and welcome to In Depth. Tonight we're going to devote the entire program to an investigation of violence. In particular, we'll be looking for the causes and hopefully even some of the possible Where's solutions Tanya? for the violence. You're on out. Where? Where to? The increased incidence uh, uh, of unmotivated bashing, culminating in last night's brutal murder now. of a young woman in Footscray, and then special weight to the at this time. And I have with me here in the studio... Get the black sauce, will you? Two special guests. Mr. Eric Logan, lecturer in criminology from Melbourne University, and the man in charge of the investigation of the murder of Helen Dunlop, 
Detective Inspector Lawson of the Homicide Squad. Inspector, how likely is it that you'll find the people responsible? We think there was only one person. We'll get him. You sound pretty confident. We've got a good description, made up a photo fit. We've got every homicide car on the road. They're linked into the crime car network. Oh, yes, we'll get him. It's uh, just a matter of time. I certainly hope so. Mr. Logan, there seems to be little doubt that violence, particularly unmotivated violence, is on the increase. Why do you think this is? Oh, look, uh, literally dozens of factors at work. Now, there's no simple answer to that. <laughs> well, okay, maybe we can go into it in depth later on. Maybe we could also try and draw a profile of a basher, describe a typical background. But we have to start somewhere. Can you give us just one of the factors why these people lash out at anybody for no reason? Well, there's always a reason. It may not be a rational one. There may be no motive, but there's always a reason. I just wish you'd tell well, me whether he's going to be happy to tell you. Really. We are trying to keep it simple. Can we start off with just one? Fair enough. Well, the chances are that these kids, or at least a significant proportion of these kids who um, get involved in bad... I went to the cemetery yesterday. It might be better if you stayed away. Are you working? You'd meet people. Hey, let's stretch our legs. Come on, Charlie. It might be your last chance. I'm selling this to a development company. No. Ten million dollars. A supermarket complex with parking for 2,000 cars. Rows of brick veneer houses. And a cinema with a crying room for those that remember trees, grass and flowers. <laughs> Don't take that money, Michael. You don't think I want to be a policeman all my life, do you? What is it? Last time, you said I should call you whenever I felt depressed. I tried again this morning. The footbridge over the red. Oh, Michael, help me! Will you be all right? Now, no more of that nonsense. And you'll see a psychiatrist? Yes. That's my girl. Uh, give my love to Joan of Arc. Have you time to say hello? Uh, not this time, sorry. He makes your eyes sparkle, Sherry. Who is he? Tell me about him. His name's Michael. Michael Peters. Michael? It is a manly name. He is Catholic, huh? Has he a profession? He's a policeman. A detective. A gendarme once asked my papa if he could marry me. He brought me a box of chocolates. He had such a fine moustache, but he was fat and red. Soup stains down the front of his uniform, always. And the nuts and the chocolates were alive with weevils. Oh, I repeat myself, I grow old. Tell me more about your young man. He's been married. Mm -hmm. There was a divorce. Go on. You've met him before. Oh. When he came to the house. When your mama and papa. When I tried to kill myself. He's so kind, so considerate. You have something for him, Cherie? I think so. He's always so light-hearted. He, he stops the rain, you know? Has he told you that he loves you? He will. He will. I know men. Sometimes they are very slow and stupid. They run fast towards a war, but they walk slowly into marriage. <laughs> Des enfants. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. Who was it? 
Chummy? Nobody. Wrong number. Where are you in bed, Cherie? No, I, I, I was in the garden. Walking. Come to bed now. France, but I was glad to come home. Home? Australia. Oh, let's not forget Tasmania. Would you like to live in France now? Perhaps. I was a young child on holiday before. Maybe a bit different now I'm grown up. Viva la grown-ups. After my parents died, Aunt Bertha wanted to just go and live in France. She's got relatives there, and I think she's often very lonely. Perhaps I should have gone. What do you think, Michael? I don't know. But they're here, Michael. And I don't want to leave them. Stop it. Come on, Joe. <laughs> I'm sorry. I cried too much for no reason. I love you, Michael. You are happy. I will go and make you some warm milk to help you sleep. But I don't feel like sleeping. Sweet dreams will do you more good than sunken eyes. <laughs> Here you know Mr. Peters. We're engaged. You don't say? Well, that is good news. All the best. Ah, oh, great bloke, Mick. Uh, might be a copper, but he's got a heart of gold. Uh, that'll be two dollars even. Yeah, he was at the accident when me boy got knocked down. Looked after young Neil like he was his own. You know, went to see him in the hospital. Took him toys and lollies. He's a man with a heart, Miss Boucher. Too soft at times, give you the shirt off his back. I've never met a more sympathetic fella in all my life. He just can't say no to anyone. Oh well, good luck. Look, have I said something out of place? Is Sally Perkins your sister? Yes, she is. Why? I'm afraid she's dead, Mrs. Lovejoy. Dead? 
Uh, right. Oh, where does that leave us? Uh, brown trousers, green and tan check shirt, old jacket. Brown sort of tweed. Shoes? Brown lace-ups with pointed toes. What about his papers? Well, he normally carries them everywhere. It's, well, it's virtually a habit. I'll get that off to D24 with the physical description. Thanks, Harry. Um, you came down a couple of weeks ago in April. Um, you here for good? Well, it's difficult. We don't really know. My husband runs a business on the Sepik River. Timber, artifacts, crocodile skins, things like that. Well, lately, times haven't been so good. My husband is... Did your sister and your husband get on well? Not very well, no. And he's not that kind of man, really. He's, he's not very sociable. Probably why he likes New Guinea so much. And you don't? I'm married to him. He's my husband. I'm afraid I have rather quaint ideas about duty. And you say he's ill? I said he wasn't very well. He has a lot of chest trouble and the climate's no help. But he's certainly not sick enough to do anything terrible to my sister, if that's what you're thinking. Probably gone out to the shops or something. Hello? Who? Yes, that's right, darling. Listen, listen, where are you? What? Now, I can't hear you properly. Yes, yes, that's better. Darling, it's Sally, she's... What? Oh, my God. How much? No, of course I can't. Listen, yes, they're here with me now. Listen, where are you? Your husband. He says he did it. He says he murdered my sister. Because my family live here. My, my brother's a doctor and my sister used to. I'm, I'm sorry. Senior Deegan will be back soon. He'll stay with you for a while. I'm afraid we'll have to ask you to identify your sister. But there's, there's no hurry. If anything else occurs to you, um, tell Senior Deegan. You think Gordon might come back, then? Must be strange, city life, after living in the Highlands. I wouldn't dispute that, thank you. Do you miss it at all? Have you ever lived in New Guinea? No. Have you ever been there? No, I haven't. Before I joined the force, I was going to uh, enroll as a patrol officer. Seemed like a good life. For the right kind of person, it's fine. You might have been the right kind of person, I don't know. Is your husband the right kind of person? He was once, when he was younger. In Moresby, especially. I thought he was trading up to Sepik. He was, is. But before that, he was down in Moresby. Served in the House of Assembly, you know. Made speeches, worked on delegations, attended receptions. That was where we first met. Reception for the Indonesian minister. April the 1st, 1972. April Fool. He was very drunk and I drove him home. Then you went up to see me? Yes. And hated it. You make very nice coffee for a policeman. It's practice. You must hold a lot of hands. No, not really. Uh, these of uh, New Guinea? No, England, actually, Devon. Jemima? No, do. They're my other sister's kids, all three of them. I'm godmother to Andrew, he's the eldest. He's the only one I've ever seen, actually, more's a pity. They're lovely kids, aren't they? Hmm. Did you miss England? More than I can say. Something the matter? Yeah. 
We have found your husband. And, uh, I'm afraid he's dead. Where'd he get to? The airport. We found him in a lavatory. In a lavatory? All right, boys. Let's yeah. Go. There was a razor involved. Was he shaving? No. It uh, seems to have been suicide. He always said he'd do that. He's a very frightened man. Death appalled him. Old age, too. Tried to drown himself once on the Seapit River. With a large piece of concrete and a long rope. He was too drunk to tie the knot. Should have waited till the rains came. Done a good job. There'll have to be an identification, I'm sorry. Don't be. I'm getting quite an expert. Yes, I know. Would you mind coming now? My parents were dead against the marriage. He drank a lot even then. How could I tell them I was pregnant? I followed him up there. It was the end of May by this time. The baby was only five months ago. Due in October. Well, anyway, he suddenly decided it was impossible. What was? The baby. He didn't want it, it didn't fit in, didn't suit his local image. So what happened? He got rid of it. With a little help from his friends. After that, things just got worse. You got out? Ran away? Yes. Of course, it wasn't as simple as it sounds. Not up there. I had to plan it for months. Earn some local favors, try and save a bit of money. But yes, then I, I got out. Of course, I never dreamt he'd come after me. But he did. Three weeks later, barely time for a bath and a change of clothes. I tried for days. We argued a lot. I even tried moving around, but it, it was hopeless. He always found me. So, in the end, I... I killed him. If you can call it that. Pathetic, isn't it? He was so drunk most of the time, I... I don't really think it makes any difference. What on earth's going on? That's Dr. Sawley's car, isn't it? Well, wait here. Julia's dead. Murdered. My God. Grant? Who else? Darling? We have to do something about Grant Edwards. Must be money in public relations. I wouldn't know. Inspector Lawson? That's right. Colin Anderson. Senior Detective Redford. Uh, would you come round to the pool? We can have a drink. I want to get this over with as soon as possible. So do my friends, Inspector. Peter didn't realize how serious this was for Grant Edwards. But now you do. Well, I never dreamt anyone would suspect him. Now you do, and you want to help him. Well, I only want to tell you what we saw, Inspector. Why didn't Edwards mention this to us? Well, I've said we saw him walking toward the cricket ground, but I don't think he saw us. You drove past him, but you didn't stop. Yes, we were on our way out for the day, water skiing, running late. Didn't blow the horn, wave. Grant's a very reserved sort of fellow. Mr. Williams and uh, you, Mrs. Williams, You'll be required to make a statement about this. We're prepared to do that. And if necessary, go to court and give evidence. Yes. Tell him. 
What's the matter? Are you missing Julia? Ronald Bell was convicted of the murder of Julia Edwards and is now serving a term of life imprisonment. Uh, thank you. Would you like some coffee? Uh, no, thanks. There's plenty in the pot and no shortage of cups in this house. No, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Are you forbidden to drink coffee on duty? Uh, no, Mrs. Marshall. Well, what about you then, Mr. Peter? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, that's that. I think the point is they're not supposed to fraternize with suspects. Oh. We've only just got up and haven't had breakfast, so you won't mind if we go ahead? No, of course. This is the new coffee. Tell me what you think of it. I'll stand by. Ah, yes. I like it. Strong, clean flavor, plenty of body. Good. Mm, nice. Well, then you'd like to know exactly what happened. If you wouldn't mind. Why did you go into the gardens that time of night, Mr. Marshall? Well, I was driving home and pulled Where up at the gardens. Been? At my office in the city, working. On a Saturday night? Yes. I had a huge backlog of work and nothing to stay home for. I was out at a committee meeting. Yes, about 11 o'clock. I pulled up at the gardens to answer a call of nature. And I noticed a young fellow in a tracksuit hanging around on the lawn. Near the street? Yes. Did you talk to him? Not at that point. I went off to the toilet. But when I came out, there he was. He'd obviously followed me. I was laughing at what he said to you. Oh. Well, tell them. <laughs> yes, the young gentleman said to me, you've got a beautiful car. A beautiful man driving a beautiful car. What more can I ask? I can imagine how you felt. Yes, it was my first head-on collision with a pansy. Why did you hit him? I'm coming to that. His next remark was, how would you like to take me in your beautiful car? I said to him, not tonight, Josephus, and walked past him, but he skipped along beside me. He said to me, what's wrong with tonight? What is it, dear? No ashtray. Oh. Yes, he said to me, what's wrong with tonight? It's a lovely night for love. You two are a very unresponsive audience. What happened then, Mr. Marshall? Well, at least they're interested, Lloyd. Yes. So I said to him, shove off, you little bastard, and pushed him away. But he flew back at me and kicked me in the shins. It hurt, so I flattened him. How does that stack up with what he told you? He alleges that you accosted him. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. He said that you punched him because he called you a rotten pervert. There's no doubt about them, is there? Uh, who do you mean, Mr. Marshall? Homosexuals. Well, do you have expert knowledge of them? No, I told you. Then what do you mean, there's no doubt about them? I was referring to the little jerk's talent for twisting the facts. That's typical from what I've heard. Mr. Peters, we have been married for 12 years, and I can assure you my husband is not homosexual. The position is, Mrs. Marshall, that a young lad has made a complaint, and we have to make a thorough investigation. I see. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Marshall. We'll be in touch. I'll see you out. <clears throat> thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Marshall. Goodbye, Sergeant. Off now? Yes. Are you going to work from home all day? No, dear. I'll be going into the office after lunch. I'll see you this evening, then. Anything wrong, Lindy? Oh, I I'm worried. Those detectives frightened me. Forget about them, sweetie. They look grim and suspicious on principle. Oh, it wasn't that. It... Well, they didn't seem to believe you. There's still nothing to worry about. If it went to court, that boy would go to pieces under cross-examination. How do you know? Well, he's very young, and he'd be telling lies. Do you think he could stand up to a man like Henderson? Perhaps not. But even if you won, I mean, you'd still be hurt. People always enjoy thinking the worst of someone who's successful. The gossip would be awful. It certainly would. 
but we're indulging in morbid fantasies. They'd never charge me on the unsupported word of that little pansy. So, off you go on your shopping spree and concentrate on the wholesome sport of wasting my hard-earned money. Jane, it's Lindy Marshall. Oh, uh, hi, Lindy. Well, I'm very worried, Jane. You know about Lloyd, I suppose. I know something about it, yes. Can you possibly find out what the police are doing, the detectives? Can you find out if they're going to prosecute him? I only know that they're investigating. Well, could you possibly find out for me? I'm afraid not, Lindy. You see... They know that I'm a friend of yours, and they wouldn't appreciate my asking them. But Jane, it's, it's getting me down. I, I can't think of anything else. Look, they seem to think he might be homosexual, and that's ridiculous. I mean, I should know, for God's sake. Yes, but looking at it from C.I.'s point of view, there have been cases. You mean women who've been married to homosexuals for years without knowing? Well, it has happened, Lindy. And in a matter like this, it's a case of C.I.'s not ruling out the possibility. Oh, all right, Jane. Goodbye. Are we going to the Hendersons tonight? Yes, 8.30. I'll leave it here, then. You look lovely. Have a nice time in the city? Not really. Have you heard from the police? I'm glad you asked me that. Yes, I've heard from the police. Matter of fact, I've been interviewed again. What happened? The good news outweighs the bad. Oh, come on, tell me. They are now satisfied that the boy accosted me. And now for the moderately bad news. They are going to proceed against me by summons. What for? I'm to be charged with common assault. I know how you feel. Common assault. Sounds so damn plebeian. How can they do it? You were provoked. I mean, he kicked you. Yes, that's true. But that wasn't so serious. They argue that I hit him much too hard. And they're quite right. I'm bigger than he is. I could have just pushed him over and walked away. But he was such an obnoxious little runt. Well, it's going to be dreadful, the court case. Not as bad as you might expect. You see, there's some more good news. I'm going to plead guilty. Well, that means that the boy won't have to appear. Won't have to give evidence. It'll all be over in a few minutes. At the worst, I'll be fined a few dollars. I see. Let's go in for a drink. It could still do you a lot of harm, Lloyd. People will talk and exaggerate. It's not going into the Supreme Court, darling. It'll be rushed through before a magistrate. And who's to know about it? Are you forgetting about the local press? No, I'm not forgetting about the local press. I'll be increasing my advertising. There'll be no write-up. What would you like, darling? A sheriff. Did you say sherry? Yes. Good. No, I'll, I'll have a brandy. A brandy, did you say? Good. Are they going to charge the boy with accosting? Are they? No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, I brought that point up as a matter of fact. But they said Master Thornton was so young, and they thought the correct thing to do was to tell his mother and hope that she could cope with it. But that doesn't make sense, Lloyd. Well, darling, she's, he's very Have young. Have you told me the truth? Lindy. When have I ever lied to you? Derek? Any new developments? Ross, no, nothing. I've just been trying to ring Jeff to come and pick you up. Didn't tell us your flight number. Well, there wasn't time. I went to the airport and was a flight boarding. Look, what are the police doing? Everything they can. Now, look, we've had no actual demand, but we've had a videotape from her. Oh. 
Oh, she's all right. Oh, isn't there anything we can do? Yes, we just have to wait. Now, look, now, come and sit down and relax. Eric. Where's your suitcase? Oh, my God, I've lost it somewhere. Well, look, never mind, never mind. It's not important. We can find clothes here. I, I haven't been able to oh, think Rose. since you called. Ross, please. You should have heard from him by now. I mean, what could be keeping him? He said he'd be in touch as soon as possible. He couldn't make any promises. He's no better than the police. He can't work miracles, Ross, and besides, I told him not to take any chances. Well, what happens now? What happens if he rings the office? I've left word I'm here. But the... Look, Leo knows about the recorder. He won't say anything out of place. Roz, in his own way, Leo cares as much for Kim as we do. He did. He said he could guarantee Kim's safety. With people like that, he was in no position to even guarantee his own. By agreeing to pay Mr. Clayton, you virtually signed his death warrant. It was my fault, Inspector. I asked Derek to do it. If, if anyone's to be... I made the decision. I had to do something. She's been gone for days. You've been able to do nothing. If we're to save your daughter's life, Mr. Clayton, I want your assurance that there'll be no more payments, no more arrangements until we've been consulted. We'll give it, Derek, won't we? But for God's sake, do something. I don't like it, my mummy. <laughs> your current record is shallow, noisy, and vulgar. <laughs> and I talk to talent, potential talent. I always work in stages. Stage one is to knock the absolute stuffing out of them. I can't wait for stage two. You see, the reason I'm so successful is that I manage, in the strictest sense of the word. You know the definition of manage. Well, uh, The definition I prefer is to subject a person or animal to one's control. You've got me all confused. I came in here feeling like Elton John. Now I feel like Elton Pomeroy. Who's Elton Pomeroy? Exactly. <laughs> if you signed with me, you'd work your tail off. I'll take over your entire life. A whole new image, for starters. A new image? I haven't even got an old one yet. Forget the <laughs> razzle-dazzle to you, Bob, stuff, because I think you could crack that generation gap. Under my control, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah what? I'm thinking of markets for the teens. Well, you've got a nice, ordinary look about you. <laughs> sort of like a aging paper boy. <laughs> yeah. This time I'm not going to ask. For the older bracket, well, you look relatively clean and trustworthy. That has a certain novelty value. <laughs> yeah, I'd set him as a sort of family thing. Something bright and wholesome that appeals to all age groups. Sound like a son of Bambi. <laughs> but you need grooming, packaging, promoting. For one year, I want to control your life. What you sing, what you wear, who you see, where you go, what you read, everything. That sounds awful. In one year's time, Bobby Farrell, superstar. Well, that sounds terrific. Will you do it? <laughs> I'll do it. Good. First of all, no smoking. No. Secondly, no swearing. Family image, remember? Oh, I've agreed to a year of this, and the first minute's killing me. Now, if I'm going to promote you, then I need to know everything. Tell me about your family. Well, Mum died when I was a kid. Bobby Farrell's childhood agony. No, it wasn't like that. Next, what about your father? Well, Dad was a vaudeville comedian. Was? Is he dead too? Wonderful. <laughs> Bobby Farrell, tragic orphan of pop. Oh, no, no, Dad's still alive. Oh, pity. <laughs> One good angle screwed. Never mind. What else about your father? Nothing else. Well, did he slave night and day trying to be mother and father both? <laughs> no way. Well, there must be some way we can use well, it. I haven't seen him for years. He left home. He used to gamble a lot and he was always in debt, out of work and drunk. It was no surprise when he wasn't chosen father of the year. <laughs> well, why did he leave? He said he had a booking interstate at some club to do his act for a week. That was seven years ago. Seven years? Yeah. And he promised to be back in time for my birthday. Maybe you remember 38. Okay, let's forget about your father. Who? <laughs> See, I can even joke about it. Doesn't worry me at all. Oh, it worried me for a time, but well, what was there to miss? I mean, when we did live together, all he would do was drink, gamble, and tell corny jokes. And then there was his bad side as well. In terms of your new image, he sounds about as helpful as a paternity suit. Oh, don't worry. He's long ago and far away. Let's keep it that way. And talking of paternity suits, I want you to promise me. No steady girlfriends, no heavy dates. Oh. I'm starting to feel the strain. Already I've given up smoking, swearing, girlfriends and fathers. I forgot to mention drinking and late nights. <laughs> Is it all right if I see my Uncle Oz every now and again? Just socially, of course. Oz? Yeah, it's short for Ozma. He's coming to visit me tonight. Your father's brother? Yeah. But, but let's put it this way. My father is rated R, but Uncle Oz is definitely for general exhibition. <laughs> okay. 
No way. No way. <laughs> We've got a career to think of. Something to nibble, Hilda? Thank you, no. I'm saving my appetite for my Lord and heir. Oh, pardon? We're lunching together. Oh, oh, how exciting. He's graciously consented to let me write one of my little at-home pieces about him. Mm, I've just been reading this week's. You uh, do them so beautifully, Hilda. Oh, don't be silly. Do I? Yes, those lovely double-page spreads. Do you know, Della, that Family Week has the highest circulation of any magazine in Australia? I had no idea. Absolutely. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> All those readers. And my little column, at home with whoever it might be, is the most widely read feature in the entire magazine. And so it should be. And do you know why? I can't imagine. I mean, why would that be? <laughs> because it is an oasis in the desert. I like that. In a desert of ugliness, promiscuity and vice. <clears throat> you make an awful lot of sense, awful lot. Uh, now, Hilda, oh, my Lord Mayor will be waiting for me at the town hall. We're having a cosy little luncheon, just the two of us in the banquet room. Hilda, just before you go, I'd like your advice. You see, I've discovered this young singer, a very talented boy called Bob, uh, Robert Farrell. <laughs> Robert Farrell? I've never heard of him. Well, it's not surprising. At this rate, I doubt you ever will. At what rate? Well, the media people seem to think he's dull, just because he doesn't smoke, drink... Sleep around, use four-letter words. Does that make a person dull, Hilda? But he's exactly the sort of young man who deserves publicity. Well, it's no use, they just don't want to know him. Well, I want to know him. Now, this is one of my hobby horses. We have got to make virtue popular, fashionable. There's this conspiracy of silence. It's really so unfair. Well, they can't silence me. I'll interview him at once. Where is he? Uh, but you've got my Lord Mayor. Your Lord Mayor. Who? Yes. Well, I'll do your young man tomorrow. And that's a promise. What's that? How's Miss Farquhar? Heavily sedated. <laughs> well, I uh, suppose I'd better find myself another manager. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. But there is a problem. What? The latest top 40 chart released today, your record has shot up to number one. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> So, for the time being, it looks as though we're stuck with one another. But you get rid of that... that father. Oh, sure, he'll only be staying for another night. Good. Or two. Well, how about a cup of tea? No, thank you. I'm uh, told you ought to teach me Serbo-Croatian. Yes. Very nice. I hope we'll be friends. We shall get to know each other, Major, probably very well. We shan't be friends. You spoke to Major Barrington? I think I have the wrong person. He said to contact a Captain Fulton. Sit where you are. I'm Captain Fulton. How was Major Barrington when you last saw him? Dead. When? A month ago. Near Yeche. If he gave you a message, it must mean you were with him when he died. Why has it taken you so long? I'm a medical officer with a partisan mobile force. The commissar would not release me. I'm AWL. I may as well tell you that Major Barrington and I worked very closely together. Now give me the message. I'm to contact you. You're to arrange that I meet a Colonel Smythe in London. I am to tell him Operation Overlord and give him four names. What names? I'm to report in person. Oh, out of the question. What are the names? He stressed it. He said, tell no one here. We're penetrated. I'd suggest you tell me a little more about yourself. I'm not sure yet how much I can believe of what you say. Baby, please, come away from that edge. It's not safe. If, if you were to slip down there... You know, pulling Sean away from that edge like that could instill in him a totally unnatural fear of heights. Kids learn that stuff. Did you know that? For your mother's sake, stay away from the edge.
Your name is Catherine Elaine Peterson? Yes. You have been charged and convicted of murder. You have been sentenced to 15 years jail to serve a minimum of 12, is that correct? You needn't worry about me, Mother. I know how to handle people. I hate to hear you being so cynical, Kate. You used to be such a sweet little girl. I don't know when you adopted this hard attitude. You always thought I was so sweet simply because I knew how to handle you. If I'm cynical, it's your fault. It didn't take me long to learn that if I smiled prettily and I hugged you tightly enough, I could have almost anything I wanted. That's a dreadful thing to say. It makes it sound as though you've gone through your whole life manipulating people. One has to use what talent one possesses. You had a great talent, Kate, as a doctor. Everyone admired you. I'll never understand how you got involved defrauding the government. Because it was very lucrative. How many reasons do you want? I still can't believe you actually killed a man. I had to. He was going to report me. Poor Conrad. If only he could have seen things my way. He loved you, Kate. Well, not enough. He was a fool. Like the women in here are fools. Anyway, we shouldn't be talking like this in front of Gerard. Do you know you've hardly spoken to him? <laughs> What's the point? He looks on you as his mother. Well, is it any wonder? After all, I virtually brought him up. <laughs> well, don't expect me to get maternal at this late stage. No point to it, is there? Not while I'm in here. Well, I shall have to play the distraught mum to the hilts when I'm testifying. Is that all he means to you? A chance of acquittal? Well, at least it's something, isn't it? Up to now, he's only been a nuisance. You're not... David, you obviously have something on your mind, so would you stop this legal run around and tell me what it is? Well, I, um, I've discovered some rather interesting facts. I hope you can put them to good use. They may be best left well alone. Go on. In the course of my investigations, I came across your account books. And in particular, some rather large discrepancies. And? As you say, I'm your family lawyer. And my duty may be compromised by delving too deep. But if I did, I could well come up with the real reason you murdered your friend. Is that a professional opinion? No, it's a personal one. Good. Well, let's keep it that way. It concerns the McNally mob. Go on. I have information. Details of unsolved crimes, who's involved. Featuring one Mr. Fitzwater. Fitzwater, eh? And it's good information. Best you can buy. Who's anything about buying? I did. But not for money. I'm uh, planning an appeal against my sentence. You're going to find me a witness. From now on, you're going to be my eyes and ears. I want to know everything that's going on in here. You want me to inform against the women? In a nutshell, yes. Suppose I don't feel that's in my best interest. I mean, I do have my own future to protect. You. Precisely. That's why you'll do exactly as I say. Otherwise, I could make it difficult for you to have any more visits. I'm sure Inspector Grace, with all his contacts, could get back that letter you wrote to the newspapers. And but if your name were to come out, that would be the end of you at Wentworth. Most unfortunate. Where have you been all day? Working in the hospital. Sandy Edwards is very much alive. Yeah? Ah, oh, well, you can't win them all. You didn't tell her I had anything to do with last night, did you? Of course not. Why should I? You're just acting strangely towards me. So was B. You don't think they suspect anything, do you? Look, I don't know. Just forget about it, it'll pass. I thought you had a foolproof scheme for getting rid of Sandy. What went wrong? It was a bloody good plan until that little bitch Doreen stuck her nose in. What? Yeah, she arrived just as we're hauling Edwards up. Didn't you have a look out on the door? Yeah, Lil, but she had to come and help me and Bev, didn't she? Oh, I don't believe it. How could you be so stupid? What did you say? Why do you ignore such a simple, important detail as keeping guard? Well, I didn't see you in on any of that heavy action. Oh, I did my part. I got the dope, I got into the showers. Oh, big deal, real brave stuff. Look, I stuck my neck out for you, you stupid idiot. Just watch who you're calling names. Don't you realise what you've done? Look, I'd be careful if I was you. All Sandy and B have to do is put two and two together if they haven't already done so, and I'm gone. Oh, God, 
I should have known better than to trust you and your thick friends. You're going to be sorry you said that. Take your hands off me. You don't scare me, you brainless bag of wind. Just don't you think you're calling nines, bitch? Leave me alone. I've got time for useless cretins like Captain, you. Captain, where are you? Now? Oh, well, well, what have we here? Nothing, Mrs. Pell, just a bit of a difference, you know. I don't know. But if there's any more of it, you'll be up in the charge. I was just on my way to dispensary, Mrs. Pearl. Then get going. Well, here we are. That should make you feel better. Looks like you could deal with it yourself. Oh? Hmm. That's a bad case of the shakes you've got there. <laughs> what? The shakes. Well, as I said before, Sister Franklin isn't the easiest person to get along with. Hmm. No, I couldn't. You'll have it. You could do with it. Oh, don't be silly. Sister Franklin might come in. Well, she can get her own. Drink it. But it's for headaches, not nerves. Drink it. Oh, no. What's going on? Mrs. Davidson? Inspector Grace will explain. What am I doing here? Well, now, you're going to be charged with fraud, Mrs. Peterson. Conspiring to import drugs into the prison, conspiring to pervert the course of justice, and now attempted bribery of a prison officer, it seems. Uh, you're mad. I don't have to stay here and listen to the... You don't have to answer any of these charges, but I must warn you that anything you say may be taken down, reduced to type, and may be used in evidence against you. Well, you'll have to get your evidence from somewhere else, won't you? Because you haven't got any. You can't prove any of these charges. What's he writing down? Oh, that's Detective Sergeant Ross. He's just doing his job. Detective? <sighs> what are you trying to do to me? You've all had a hand in this, haven't you? The attempted bribery of an officer. Sounds cheap and dirty, doesn't it? Insulting. But I seem to remember you were eager enough at the time. What happened, pal? Get cold feet. Come on, Mrs. Peterson. You've been supplying us with enough evidence yourself, don't you think? I mean, there's your attempt to rig a crooked witness and your uh, secret accounts and now bribery of a prison officer. You're going to be in here for a long time. Oh, no. You used me. You use my information. You can't keep me in here. You pig, you use yeah, it! Come on! Peterson, come on! Nobody uses me! Well, just to show I'm not resentful, I won't add assault of a police officer to the charges. Peterson, you will be placed in solitary confinement. I'll go with you. I'll kill you! Join the queue, lady. Oh, There's a waiting list. You can't keep me in here forever! I'll kill you, all of you! You're all liars! Get around! Cheat that filthy... You ready for our little chat, then? Hold it. Edwards and Peterson are missing. Maybe they went for a walk. Where's Edwards? I don't know. You were with her. You tell everyone to come inside. I just followed. I was just getting rid of the rubbish. I've seen that knife before. Edwards got it off me. And there's only one way you could have got it off her. How'd you do it, Peterson? You're no match for Edwards. She could take on two of you without even drawing breath. What are you talking about? Getting rid of Edwards, that's what. I didn't kill Sandy. She was alive when I last saw her. Oh, she just gave you the knife as a going away present, did she? 147 counts of health fund fraud. 
conspiring to commit perjury, conspiring to import drugs into prison. The list goes on and on. And you were prepared to send me into the appeals court with a bogus witness. I know the charges. And don't you preach at me. It's your job to get me off. Impossible. <laughs> Minimize the sentence, then. Look, for God's sake, you're my solicitor. Earn the money I'm paying you. Money gained by fraudulent means, Mrs. Peterson. I'm sorry I couldn't do that. I'm taking myself off the case. I suggest you apply for legal aid. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I can afford the best. There isn't an established firm of solicitors in town who will risk taking your case and not getting... I heard about your visitor, Peterson. Do you want to finish dinner at Second City? What? No, no, thank you. Can you go into the rec room, then? M Mrs. Morris. Yes? I'd like you to arrange legal aid for me. Legal aid? But you've already got a solicitor. No, no. I, I sacked him. He was a bundling fool. He didn't suit me at all. Are you all right? Besides, I've just been informed that my financial standing isn't at all that it should be, and, well, it seems I have no choice. Well, he is rather urgent, Mrs. Morris. Would you mind? Well, I'll do what I can, but I'm Thank not sure. you. I'd appreciate that. I congratulate the jury on bringing in the only verdict possible. Filthy common scum. You have been found guilty on all charges, Peterson. Don't and you, I... Peterson, me, you pompous idiot. You will address me as Dr. Peterson. Be quiet. I am a respected member of this community. I demand to be treated as such. If you don't stop, and I'll hold you. You, you have a nerve to call yourself a barrister. It's a sad day for society when you qualified. Order. How Order. dare you, cities and jettings? How dare you, you cretins? Order. You enjoyed a privileged position in the community, and you abused it, thereby lowering the standard of all your colleagues. I consider you to be a totally unprincipled character who will do anything and hurt anyone who stands in the way of your petty greed. Therefore, an example must be made of you. Catherine Elaine Peterson, I sentence you to 10 years imprisonment with a minimum of six years to be served concurrently with your present sentence. My girls are going to give you a trial you'll be crazy about. Now, uh, you weren't very happy with your defence counsel. Well, they are hard to come by, but we've got you the best. Judy. Meet your new client, Dr. Catherine Peterson. We couldn't find anyone to be uh, prosecuting counsel, so uh, I volunteered. Should be a pushover. God, you women are childish. I'm not interested in playing your stupid games. Oh, you will be, Kate. I don't even know what the game is yet. You haven't even met the judge. Rita. Meet Justice Sandy Edwards. Unfortunately, Sandy couldn't be here in person. But then you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? Go on. You haven't told me what this fast is all about yet. Oh, yes, I have. We're going to give you a fair trial on all the charges the cops missed. Now, the girls here are going to be the jury. They know what it's like to be in prison. They'll be very sympathetic. What about Winter? Oh, yeah. I've forgotten about her. You see, there are a few laws that we haven't caught up with yet. Now, if you're innocent, or well, you'll be as free as a bird. But we haven't abolished the death penalty. So if you're found guilty, you're dead. And that's where Mari comes in. She's our public executioner. Mari, meet your next customer, Dr. Catherine Peterson. You killed Sandy, didn't you? Didn't you? No! You're a damn liar. Listen, if you want to get out of here, you tell Mrs. Davidson. Then she'll put you somewhere safe. But if you're not going to do that, you're on your own. Quite frankly, I think you're overdoing it. Overdoing it? They are trying to kill me. What do you expect me to do? Mention it casually over morning tea? For God's sake, don't be so stupid. Now, that is enough, Peterson. As I said to you before, I've been here far too long to fall for an act like this. Ah, yes, and a very good one, too. Now, Mrs. Powell and Mr. Faulkner are officers of the highest calibre. Do you honestly expect me to believe this persecution story? And as for Mrs. Davidson being involved, well, as I said before...
Do you want to know something, Doc? You're dead. Beautiful smell. The smell of freedom. Hardly freedom, Peterson. Get in the van. Really sticks in your guts, doesn't it? Am I getting away? You're not getting away? You're just going to Barnhurst. I'm getting away from you and your murderers. That's all that matters. You've lost, Faulkner. Get in the van. G'day, Doc. Looks like we're going to be making this trip together. No! <laughs> no. And then she refused Officer Conway's direct order to report to you. All right, pal, that'll be enough for now. I will not tolerate insubordination, Peterson. Of course not. I quite understand that. It must be very difficult for you trying to run this place and having to put up with types like Powell. That's enough. Will you be quiet? You really must learn not to interrupt. Of course, I understand your problems, Mrs. Davidson. It's uh, never easy dealing with subordinates. Although, of course, I do realize that these menials are necessary for running a place of this type. Menial? Silence! You know, I was thinking while I was having my rest this afternoon, you could do with some help to keep the women in line. Not to mention the people who are helping you. So I've decided to help you. As a matter of fact, I find the idea of a joint venture rather challenging. I don't know what you're playing at, Peterson, but it won't work. Now, I've heard enough of your nonsense, and I demand an apology to Mrs. Powell. An apology? You are in enough trouble already. Don't make things worse for yourself. Oh, I see. You have to say these things. You feel you can't accept my offer of help in front of the staff. I think you should, you know. People get quite uncomfortable if they sense that things are being kept from them. Yes? What is it? Hell. <laughs> You all were going to beat me, didn't you? I'll show you what my Come with us, please. Oh, really, Mr. Faulkner? I'm, I'm busy. Can't it wait? No, just come with us now. We don't want any trouble, do we? No, of course not. Where are we going? To solitary. Oh, is someone sick there? right. I don't understand. Am I being punished for something? Peterson, do you remember your fight with Bryant? Fight? Yes, you attacked her. You almost strangled her. Oh, but surely I'm not being punished for that. Oh, you don't understand. There are evil forces at work in this place and, and Bryant's part of it. Oh, she was going to destroy me when I had to defend myself, didn't I? Well, didn't I? Whatever you say. Tick, 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 tick,
never stopping, never stopping, never! What are you staring at? You're spying on me, Conrad! You miserable worm! You She's out of control. Me. We'll have to get help. Go. I'll get her You're powerless against me! Powerless against me! No! Are my patients here already? No, you're going to the hospital. The hospital? That's wonderful. There's so much work for me to do there. They need me, don't they? I knew they would. Yes, of course they do. Right. Come on, Peterson. Doctor Peterson. Oh. Leaving so soon, Doc? Yes, my work here's finished. I have to get back to the hospital. Sure you do. They've got a new office for you there, too. Nice padded walls. All right, Captain. <laughs> Goodbye. I hope you'll all be better soon. Bye. 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 I'm trying to find Tara Wells. I thought you might be able to help me. Look, I'm sorry. I can't see you now. Lisa will look after you. I live up north. I was in Sydney. I went back a couple of days ago to find some information that I've been waiting on now. For almost a year. Well, well, sorry, what did you say your name was Dan again? Dan Marsh. Look, it was important enough for me to turn around and catch the next plane back. It concerns Tara. Lisa, would you ring Jerry Mars on his phone, please? How do you know Tara? In Queensland 14 months ago. Can I speak to you in the office? Joe, he's on the line right now. Sorry, whatever it is, we'll have to wait. I'll take it in my office, Lisa. Now, look. It can't wait. Shall I call Jason? It's all right, Lisa. What about Jerry Marr? I'll ring back and tell Jason to start the shoot, would you? I'm sorry, it's been a very difficult morning. In fact, absolutely chaotic. Would you like to take a seat? Thanks. Miss Randall, I know Tara trusts you. <laughs> as much as she trusts anyone. How much has she told you about herself? Why? I love Tara. I've asked her to marry me. Really? She's been seeing someone else. I want to know who that is. Is that what all this is about? Is it Greg Marsden? Look, you seem like a nice man, but really, I never involve myself in the personal lives of my clients beyond a certain point. And what if I was to tell you there was no such person as Tara Wells? You mean Tara Wells isn't her real name? More than that. Well, if she isn't Tara Wells, who is she? Stephanie Harper. Stephanie Harper didn't die in that hunting accident. She was badly mauled about, but alive. She made her way to a clinic in North Queensland, where for a period of six months, she underwent a series of operations that completely changed her appearance. She then moved back to Sydney, calling herself Tara Wells. Oh, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Apart from a friend of mine who helps trace people from the Queensland Police Department. You and I are the only ones that know anything about it. I swear to you, it's the truth. But Stephanie Harper was pushing 40. That's right. I'm a very busy lady, Mr. Marshall. If you care to... Dr. Marshall. I'm the plastic surgeon who performed those operations. You can check me out with the AMA. I help create Tower Worlds. I've never betrayed a patient's confidence. But then I've never been in love with a patient before. I also believe she's in considerable danger. So please, who is it? Greg Marston. Not a word to anyone. Thanks, Joanna. Why did you give her a lift home? I often did. We were friends. And she was having problems. 
Who have problems? Most normal. Students come to me for help, and I feel it's part of my job to do what I can. So what were these problems? I can assure you they have nothing whatsoever to do with what's happened. I'll decide that. She was having problems coming to terms with her sexuality. Meaning? She was ambivalent about her desires. Were you having an affair with her? I hardly think that's relevant. Were you? I make a point of never having an affair with my students, either male or female. Did she have a lover, then? Not that I'm aware of. The rehearsal had gone well. She was beginning to come to terms with herself. She was happy, relaxed. If you'd excuse me for a moment. So that's him. Do you know him? He almost reminds me. <laughs> Couldn't be. Who? My ex-husband. Perhaps it's just bad memories. Or perhaps it isn't. Detective Sergeant Turner. Get out of the way down here. Almost drove right past. It suits me. I find it cuts down on the number of unnecessary visitors. Doesn't the silence get to you? No. I like the sound of the sea. Better than the noises some people make. Mm. Give me the hustle and bustle of the city any day. One person's nectar is another person's poison. Drink. I had a few drinks on the plane, did we? Are you suggesting that I, Agent 005, is a man that can't hold his liquor? You never. Okay, no. Mum, that's what I want. That's what we're going to do. Kane, I haven't read your father's report yet, but... I know, Mum. If I get any funny ideas to run off into town to Taiwan on, Liz will be there to stop me. I've spoken to the welfare department and apparently there's a shortage of social workers out there too. But Liz, this is Kane's problem. You'll be throwing away your career here. I've always wanted to work in the outback, but I was always too chicken to go on my own. With Kane there, well... But you haven't known each other very long. We know that, Mum. And that's something we're not going to rush into. But we're going to give it time to see what happens. Andrew? Well, I see to have got it all worked out. Kane? Mum, I know we can make it work. I'm sure we can. All right, I don't want you to go, but, well, I won't stand in your way. Thank you. Ryan, Andrew has his family. Uh, um, Andrew can do most of his work by telephone. We'd have to fly out there occasionally, but there's usually a spare seat on the plane if anyone wants to tag along. Now, I know why we voted you our managing director. Mrs. Burton. Sergeant Croydon, could we have a chat, please? Yeah, of course. Come on through. Thank you. Would one of you bring a cup of coffee for Mrs. Burton, please? Meaning me, I suppose. Use a clean cups, Mags. Is a JP and a counsellor. So what? I can't charge her without proof. This is all the proof you need, I'm surely. I'm afraid not. We'd have to catch her in the act, if you'll pardon the expression. Then I'll just have to ask my husband to raise her to counsel. With all due respect, Mrs. Burton, it is a police matter. Of course, I could always have a word to Ted Faulkner. He's an old friend of my father's, after all. Inspector Faulkner would tell you the same thing. No, the police aren't going to do anything. I said I can't lay charges without proof, which I am working on obtaining. Uh, failing that, we could always have a friendly chat with her, let her know she's not welcome. I should hope you'd do more than that, Sergeant. After all, Mount Thomas is still a good, clean town. Can't allow this sort of thing to develop. Carla, your uh, special massages. Uh, look, Carla, it's kind of desperate, if you know you what I mean. So I was hoping you might be able to yes, squeeze yes, me. Yes, Mrs. Burton, just leave it with me. Okay. He's uh, told you that it's all my fault, I suppose. No. He will. Perhaps he's right. I had my committees, my charities. Clive had his job, his justice of the peace duties. 
both of which were obtained through my contacts, my influence. He was a nothing, you know. A nobody when I married him. He owes me everything. How dare he? A, a prostitute. The whole idea is absolutely repulsive. I... I do love him, Tom. I'm not a demonstrative woman, and... certain things are... But for me, it was... It was always love. I knew he didn't feel the same, but I thought, after 25 years. Anyway, I've uh, spoken to the solicitors about a divorce. Really, there's no other way. I mean, I, I do have a certain reputation to uphold. You stuck out here, slaving over a hot stove as usual. Lovely to see you, Hillary. You work so hard, such long hours. You're always so cheerful. We don't know how you keep it up at your age. Can I get you something? And always so generous. Perhaps, perhaps another time. I'm here on the matter of business. Oh, we have already sent the check in the hospital tonight. Oh, I'm sure you have. I get so many donations, I really can't keep track. No, it's um, it's about your speech. Speech? The speech you're making tomorrow. What speech? The Erinsborough Professional Women's Breakfast. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard of it. Oh, I do hope you're joking. Hillary, I know nothing about a speech tomorrow or any other day. I do not make speeches ever. But you were chosen as our guest speaker at the last, last meeting. Well, I wasn't there. Uh, or the one before, or the one before that. <laughs> Well, it has come to my attention that you haven't attended one of our business lunches for... For well, as long as you've been president. Oh, fancy that. Well, it, it was in the newsletter, and I did write to you personally outlining all the details. You must have received it. I posted it myself. Well, if you posted it, then it was obviously sent, but I didn't receive it. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You haven't got much time, have you? Well, neither of you. You've got to find a replacement. Oh, well, the members will be so, so disappointed. I mean, the, the businesswoman of Erinsborough looked to you as a leading light. Well, you can just tell them the light's gone out. Oh, very cruel. Oh, dear, it's so disappointing. I always thought you took your responsibilities to, to the community as, as, as seriously as anybody. Well, of course I do. And I look up to you as a leading member, and a, a member who is absolutely reliable, apart from non-attendance. But of course, you choose to let the organisation down. I have never let this or any other organisation down. Good. Then you'll be there. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how much we're looking forward to hearing your little speech. Good morning, Madge. I've never been here before. Quite a quaint little house. We find it adequate for our needs. Yes, I'm, I'm sure it must be. So what's happened? Some disaster befallen the uh, Professional Women's Association? Oh, heavens no. But there has been a change of plan. Oh, my goodness, is that your speech? Oh, quite a hefty document. And judging by those bags under your eyes, you've been up half the night working on it. Really, it's very remiss of me not to have let you know about this change last night. Just exactly what is the change? I've had to allow extra time in the programme for an address by the mayor. So you now only have five minutes. Five minutes? Well, I'm sure that's more than enough time for an overview of your life in the coffee shop, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't want to bore the members. Five minutes, then. Just edit out all the boring bits. I'm sure you'll end up with a much better speech. I'll see you at the meeting, dear. No call in the health inspector. But nothing like that at all. Nobody said a word. In fact, one of the boys actually said to me that they were the best pies he'd ever tasted. <laughs> and from that moment, we knew we were going to make it. I enjoyed the presentation a great deal. It would never have occurred to me to drop the formalities and go with the common touch. Oh, there's a lot to be said for the common touch, Hillary. You should try it sometime. Uh, 
That's all right, son. Uh, I'll handle this. I'm still station commander. I saw the flowers outside. Your colleague, she must have been much loved. You must be Dr. McCarthy. Alan. And you are? Uh, Tom Croydon. I'm in command here. Uh, I'll let the inspector know that you've arrived, and then I'd like you to start with my two youngest members. Because the older ones are hanging tough. You've done this before, haven't you? Could I introduce uh, Dr. Ellen McCarthy to you from the psych unit? She's here to do some counselling. Constable Joe Parrish. Joe. Jack Lawson. Jack. Uh, this is Chris Riley. She's the owner of this establishment. Hello. Hello. Any chance of using a room? Yeah, of course. Sure. Do we have a choice here, boss? None at all. My great granddad, he was in First World War. He's a mad old bucket. He always used to say, just cop it sweet, son. Just cop it sweet. Does that work for you? Does that work for me? Tell me about Maggie. Maggie, she was... Ah, oh, like a big sister. <laughs> she, she didn't rouse on you, she... She'd pull you into line. She'd <laughs> she came up to my armpit. <laughs> she was like my little big sister. I've been looking forward to meeting you, PJ. Well, I actually wasn't going to come, but I was dropping Maggie's dress uniform off for the uh, for the funeral. Yes. And I thought I'd just come in and. Well, please have a seat. <sighs> so what do we do? We uh, we have a chat. That's the basic idea, yes. Right, well, you should know that I am a suspect. Oh? Oh, yeah, you see, Maggie and I were going to get married, and that instantly puts me in the frame, because statistically, we always look to the partner, so... You see, Maggie and I were going to go away together, and I've since found out that, that well, she was going to go without me. And that upset you? <laughs> oh, yeah, bloody oath it did. See, I don't, I don't let go of things that matter to me that easily. I, I really get stuck in. Oh, the thing is, you know, being a suspect, it, it really gets in the way. Someone dies, someone you love dies, you just want to let it go. You don't really want people uh, watching you or taking evidence against you. Sometimes I... Uh... Sorry. Uh, sometimes I actually wish that I'd gone with. Her. <laughs> because I know that I never, ever would have left her. Never.